Good afternoon. Welcome to Advisor Investments Quarterly Update, Stocks, Bonds, and the Fog of War, our investment perspective. Thanks for spending time with us today. It's Wednesday, April 20th, 2022. I'm Liz Kesselman, and I will be your moderator. Well, 2022 announced itself loudly back in January and has been kicking up a storm since. Today, we'll touch on what's been happening the last couple months. We'll cover topics ranging from inflation to the Fed and the bond market. We'll also take a look back at historical military intervention and its impact on markets. And of course, a buzzword of late, recession. We'll touch on our thoughts there too. So promises to be a very substantial hour ahead. For the next 30 minutes, Advisor Investments Chairman Dan Wiener and our Research Director Jeff DeMasso will speak on all of this and more. They'll be followed by a 30-minute Q&A led by Jim Lowell, Advisor Investments Chief Investment Officer. And Jim will be joined by members of the investment team Liz and Charlie. If you have any questions for our team, please do submit them on your screen. We'll do our best to get them to them today. And for those that we don't get to, please rest assured we'll get back to you in the next couple of days. There will also be a replay of today's webinar on advisorinvestments.com by the end of the week. And the replay is organized by chapters or segments. So if you hear anything today that you'd like to hear again, we've made it easy for you to drill down and listen again. Quick note about your screen. So these various modules or these boxes on your screen can be dragged, moved, or resized if you want to customize your view. And for participants who are joining us on a laptop or desktop, you may have noticed we have a new reactions module on your screen. Your reaction will help us to better prepare content for the next quarterly webinar. Of course, we always appreciate a thumbs up, so we like the encouragement and have fun with those. Unfortunately, they are not yet available for those of you who are joining us on your phones or tablets. In the resource list module this quarter, we've got additional information on some of what we'll talk about today, including our bond market outlook. You can find a lot more information on advisorinvestments.com as well. And as we do every quarter, we're going to start with a series of three poll questions. The first one is now on your screen. We would like to know what your personal view is of the markets right now. Are you euphoric or excited, optimistic, neutral, pessimistic, or do you feel panicked? Please take a moment to express your feelings, and I'll briefly introduce our first two speakers. As a reminder, their complete bios for all speakers today can be found not only on our website, but also on your screen. Dan Wiener's chairman and co-founder of Advisor Investments. Many of you also know him as the editor of the Independent Advisor for Vanguard Investors newsletter. Dan founded Advisor Investments in 1994. Jeff Damaso is our director of research and works directly with Dan and Jim Lowell and leads the analyst team for Advisor Investments. He is also co-editor of the Independent Advisor for Vanguard Investors newsletter, along with Dan. So let's take a look at how you're all feeling today. It's very interesting because three months ago, we had exactly the same amount of folks who actually registered in as neutral, but what's changed is our optimistic and excited uh, participants have really dropped. Last time it was about a third of you, this time more like 8%. And so of course, where did they go? They went over to the pessimistic uh, category. Thank goodness not too many of you are panicked. So uh, with that, Dan, why don't you uh, why don't you let us know what you think and, and share some of your thanks, wisdom. Thanks, Liz, and, and thanks everybody for coming, coming to the uh, webinar. I think you did a, a fine job with the numbers. You know, last time, about a third of you said you were either pessimistic or panicked. And um, I would say it hasn't grown very much. But the fact that there are few people, uh, fewer people who are optimistic tells me that the, the topics that Jeff and I and Jim and the rest of the team are going to cover probably are going to help raise that number a little bit maybe uh, in the coming hour. So with... All that, uh, let's get into the meat of the presentation. Jeff, why don't you kick us off with a little bit of a review? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, Dan. And, and, and as Dan said, thank you all for taking some time out of your day to participate in our webinar here. So to set the stage, um, showing here returns of stocks, bonds, and cash in the first quarter. And I think there are several ways you could react to this chart. One would be hey, for a quarter that saw record inflation, the Fed start to hike interest rates, and a war break out in Europe, stocks down 5% or so, that's not too bad. That's maybe better than I thought it would be. The other way to look at it would be, 
Geez, U.S. stocks, foreign stocks, bonds, all down about 5% to 6% in the quarter. What the heck happened to my diversified portfolio? And I think they're both fair reactions to this chart. And bonds did just have their worst quarter in decades. So as the title of the webinar suggests, Dan and I are going to talk about bonds at length today. But I know this is a pressing concern for many of you. So we're going to be hosting a webinar dedicated to bonds next week featuring our bond guy, Chris Keith. So if after hearing what Dan and I have to say today, or if you just want another perspective, or if you're concerned at all about your bonds or bond funds, I encourage you to join Chris's webinar too. And there should be a box on your screen with a link that you can click to register for that webinar. Okay, getting back to this chart, while stocks declining 5% during the quarter isn't too bad, What's missing from this chart or what's not shown is that stocks did fall into a correction down about 10% to 20% off of their highs during the quarter. Now, three months ago, Dan and I, um, during our webinar, Outlook webinar, we told you that you might want to get ready for a decline like that, that a correction might be in the offing. And we weren't making a market call per se. It was more of a warning that 2021 was a particularly smooth year in the market, and normally things are a little bit more challenging. We didn't expect to see stocks fall into correction territory quite so quickly, but it has happened before, and it happened again this year. Now, with stocks and bonds both down together in the past three months, some investors have been asking about alternatives. So I'm going to bring in the returns of several different alternative assets during the first quarter. Now, clearly, commodities had a great quarter up about 23, 24%. Ongoing supply chain issues and the war in Ukraine pushed commodity prices up. But other alternatives like real estate and Bitcoin were actually down. And Vanguard's quote unquote hedge fund, the alternative strategies fund, barely beat cash. It was pretty much flat for the quarter. The point here and my takeaway is that while alternatives are often talked about as its go to when standard assets like stocks, bonds, and cash aren't performing, the returns on alternatives have been and will continue to be all over the map. All right, so with that set up, Dan and I are going to try and cover a lot of ground in the next 25 minutes or so. And let me just run you through where we're going to try and get to, so hopefully you can follow along a little more easily, and we'll, we'll recap this as well at the end. But I'm going to keep the mic for a minute, and I'm going to talk about investing during times of military conflict. Then Dan and I are both going to talk about bonds with the key point that bonds are not broken. You shouldn't give up on bonds. And then we're going to talk about inverted yield curves, inflation, the prospects for a recession. And of course, we're always going to try, the, try and tie this all back to the markets and your portfolios. So let's start talking about Russia and Ukraine and the conflict going on there. Now, it should go without saying, but I'll say it. We are dismayed by what we're seeing taking place in Ukraine. And we never mean to downplay the human impact of war, pandemics, other disasters, what have you. But we're here to talk about investing. So what are investors to make of these type of tragedies? Well, when I go back and I look at market history and I look at the performance of markets around past military conflicts, stocks on average gain ground over time. From the onset of the world wars to Cold War clashes to fighting in the Middle East, you only need to look out six months or so to see that stocks have generally risen once the bombs started falling and guns started blazing. On average, the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 7% six months after the fighting began. Now, we're not six months out from Russia invading Ukraine, but here's an update on how different global regions have fared so far since Russia invaded Ukraine. So stocks have held up the best. Uh, U.S. stocks have held up the best. And both emerging and emerging market stocks fell at their worst, about 12% at one point, but both have rebounded from there. So returns for stocks between up 5% and down 5% since the invasion, that's not too bad. And I know this doesn't quite match up with what you might expect, but it's precisely why investors need to take the 30,000-foot view and recognize what's actually going on when you invest in stocks. Stocks are a vehicle for investing in companies that provide the products and the services around the globe that people want and need. And war may shift the dynamics, but it doesn't stop the demand. I'm willing to bet that for most of us here in the U.S., our day-to-day -day lives haven't changed despite what's going on in Ukraine. 
We're still going to work. We're watching TV. We're going out to eat or cooking meals at home. We're filling prescriptions, going to the gym, calling friends and family, dialing into webinars. You, you get the point. None of that is stopped just because Putin has invaded Ukraine. And the companies that provide those goods and services to us continue to do so. Now, what's missing from this chart are bonds. And in a classic example of why timing the market is so difficult, high quality bonds like US Treasury bonds are actually down since war broke out. Now, had you told me Russia was gonna invade Ukraine, I would have guessed that bonds would do better than stocks, at least initially, but that simply hasn't happened. So Dan, why don't you talk about what's up or should I say down with bonds? Sure, thanks, Jeff. Um, and thank you everybody again for, for coming on board. Um, you know, you're right. Typically in times of stress, we think of bonds as the, the shock absorbers in the global financial markets, taking some of the pressure off of stocks. But, but I'm gonna back up a bit. Of the three main asset categories that investors typically focus on, cash, bonds, and stocks, stocks tend to get the most attention. First off, they're a growth asset, an asset that builds wealth over time. Plus, there are lots of stories to tell about stocks, electric cars, cloud services, hip, you know, hip new retailers, uh, protein-based non-meat bacon. You know, you get what I'm talking about. Cash, on the other hand, it's, it's useful. It's something we all need. It's a key component of our financial plans, but it's, um, you know, it's boring with a capital B. And yields have been horrible for years. So even with the Federal Reserve starting to hike interest rates, it's tough to find a good, fully liquid cash vehicle paying even half of 1%. Now, let's talk about bonds. On the other hand, they don't typically have great stories to tell. Yeah, I, I know many of them are backed by companies doing interesting things or building great products, but you don't usually get the same benefit from their successes or losses from their failures the way you do with a stock. That's why they're called fixed income securities. Their ultimate price and yield are fixed. Bonds simply aren't the capital builders that stocks are. Yet today, bonds are on everybody's lips because as Jeff mentioned, we've just been through one of the worst quarters in the market's history, the bond market's history. And while it's always been a bit of a surprise to me, many investors don't really understand the mechanics of bonds or for that matter, bond funds. So, you know, without further ado, the reason bonds are front and center today on investors' minds is because of the lousy returns they delivered in the first quarter and their continuing funk in the current quarter. Actually, if you take a look at this chart, which covers more than three decades worth of bond market drawdowns, you can see that the most recent decline is the largest by far. But it's important to put this into perspective. That 8% drop from the high is nothing compared to, say, the 50% declines that we've seen from stocks a couple of times over the past, oh, you know, decade or so, uh, and the average 14% declines stocks experience in any single year. Also, take another look at the chart for a second. I see about a half dozen drops of about 4%, maybe, you know, several more of at least 3%. They typically haven't engendered the kind of reaction from investors that the latest decline has. I get that. But what makes the bond market's 8% drop so headline inducing is that, you know, as I've said, bonds are supposed to be the shock absorbers when stocks are falling. They're supposed to be the steady eddies in our portfolio, generating a little income here, a little income there, keeping their prices fairly steady. And that's what bonds really have done for the past 40 plus years, which is the investing lifetime, I would guess, uh, for most of the investors on this call if not shorter. The thing that's driving the bond discussion these days is the fact that, as I think both Jeff and I have mentioned, bonds not only fell hard during the first quarter, but so did stocks. And typically, as I said, we think of bonds as being the con contrary play uh, to stocks, protecting us, that shock absorber thing. So when stocks go down, bonds are supposed to go up and take some of the stock market sting out of our portfolios. And that's why we talk quite often about the need for diversification, which we hope is going to generate what we call non-correlated returns among portfolio constituents. That didn't happen in the first quarter. But the first quarter was a bit of an anomaly. Jeff and I looked at three-month, six-month, and 12-month periods, 
and we counted the number of times stocks and bonds were both up, both down, or split, with one asset class going up and the other losing money. That big dark blue bar and the lighter blue bar are periods when stocks were up and bonds were either up with them or down. To our focus, though, let you know on bonds losing money, the thinnest bar, that the gray one, right at the top of the three time period columns, that represents the percentage of time that bonds and stocks have both turned in negative returns in the same period. And over three month periods, this only occurs 8% of the time. Over six month periods, uh, it's happened just 3% of the time. And if you look out over a full year, 12 months, and we measured 540 of them, stocks and bonds lost money in tandem just twice, which is, for those of you who like numbers, 0.37% of the time. So it would be very unusual if, say, we get to the end of 2022 and find that stocks and bonds have both lost money over the year. Okay. What's driving the decline in bonds is the prospect of higher interest rates coming. First of all, from the Federal Reserve Bank policymakers, and second, inflation. In the chicken and egg relationship between the two, lower and lower interest rates or easy money can ignite inflation if spending gets out of hand. Higher interest rates can be the cure for inflation, but can also have the impact of slowing down the economy and hitting bond prices. So if it's clear that the Fed's going to not only hike interest rates, but probably do it faster for longer with half percentage point raises compared to typical quarter point hikes. Why bonds at all? And here's the reason. Higher yields and the fundamentals haven't changed. Again, it gets to the mechanics of the bond market, bonds and bond funds. Rising interest rates and what we call tightening Fed policy is going to result in higher bond and fund, uh, you know, bond fund yields. Higher yields are going to generate more income. And these fundamentals and a few more that Jeff and I are going to talk about have not changed at all. Jeff, you going to take this next one or you want me to keep going? No, I'll, I'll jump in here. So all right. let's, let's talk a bit about that idea of higher yields. So this is Vanguard Total Bond Market Index. It's high quality investment grade corporates, governments, mortgage-backed securities. And it's what that bond fund yield, it's a measure for, for the market. And you can see that we're earning a lot more income than we were a year ago or two years ago. And I think that's really a key, key part to keep in mind is we're already getting more income. A lot of the damage has already been done. And this means that if you own the fund, again, you're getting more income than before. And if you're reinvesting into the fund or in other bond funds, you're buying more shares of the fund given that its price has fallen. So I want you to hold on to this thought that you're earning more income. I'll come back to it in a minute. We're going we're gonna to tie back into it. Uh, but as Dan said, I want to talk about bond pricing and fundamentals of bonds. And this is something that I don't think many investors understand, but is actually very important. And Dan described bonds as, quote unquote, steady eddies. And there's a good reason why bonds have been so steady. It's because they're a contract. One party is borrowing money and another is lending it. And the bond states the terms of that transaction. And this is the key part. With a bond, you know exactly how much it will be worth on a specific day in the future. That day is the maturity date, when the borrower has to return the money in full to the lender or the bond holder. And then assuming no default at the maturity date, you'll get back par or $100. Stocks do not have this feature. There is no guarantee your stock will be worth, well, anything in the future. But with bonds, again, unless the company defaults or the government defaults, you will get your money back at a specific date in the future. And it's this certainty of a future price that makes bonds a reliable offset to stocks over time. So let me try and run through some examples of this. So this is hypothetical. You buy a bond that matures 10 years from now, and in the first year, its price goes from $100 to 105. That feels good. But after those 10 years are up, the borrower is still going to pay you back $100. So over time, the price on that bond, it's going to move up, it's going to move down, but eventually it's going to get closer and closer to par or closer and closer to 100 as it gets closer to maturity. Now, of course, the opposite is true. You can take the same scenario, but this time your bond 
falls in price in the first year. That feels less good. But again, it doesn't change the fact that the borrower is going to pay you back par at maturity. So the bond's price will again move closer and closer to par as you get closer and closer to the final date. And while I'm talking about specific bonds or an individual bond you might own here, this also plays out with bond mutual funds and bond ETFs. And I'll get to that in a second. But let's run through a specific example, real time. This is an actual bond uh, from the Federal Home Loan Bank. It was issued at par in September, and it matures today. You can see that its price fell as yields rose in January and February. But even though yields kept generally rising in March and April, the price on the bond kept moving closer and closer toward par, towards 100. Why is that? Because the Federal Home Loan Bank is going to pay for $100 for the bond today. So no one would sell the bond or buy the bond at, say, $0.99, cent, $99 when they know it's going to mature at $100 in just a few days or a few weeks. So as an investor, you didn't have to do anything other than be patient for that price to move back towards par really on its own. Now, of course, this is a seven-month bond. If you owned a seven-year bond, it's not going to mature for seven years. It's going to take longer for this process to play out, but play out it will. Now, again, I've been talking individual bonds here for the past few slides, but what about bond funds? There is no maturity date on that Vanguard Total Bond Market Index Fund or any bond fund for that, mod for that matter. The same principle applies, and it applies because when you own a bond fund, you own bonds. <laughs> the price of your bond fund might decline, and when it declines, it's falling because the price of the bonds in the portfolio are dropping. But if nothing changes, the bonds in the portfolio will, will eventually see their prices recover towards par with time, and the price of your bond fund will also recover. Or as I showed, the opposite is true. If the price of your bond fund goes up due to the price of the underlying bonds increasing in price, well, eventually, the price of those bonds are going to come back down toward the par, and your bond fund will also come down in price as well. And you can see this play out, play out with the Vanguard Total Bond Market Index here. So I'm showing... The price of that bond fund in the dark blue line over time, and you can see over the past three decades that it has barely budged. And this was during a time when yields were falling and bond prices were supposed to be rising. Instead, all of the return, that other dashed line at the top is the total return, all of the total return pretty much, and it gained over 400%, was from the income or the interest you earned on those bonds. Jeff, I love this slide. I hope everybody's taking a good look at this because it tells a story that I think most bond and bond fund investors simply don't get. You know, it's not the price, it's the income or the yield, whether it's a bond or a bond fund, that drives returns in the bond market over time. I think this is a great slide. Anyway, keep going. No, thanks. I, I agree. And you're, you're right. Like this was, a, again, a, year, a period where yields were, ri yields were falling and bond prices were supposed to be rising. But all of the return came from the income. So if we get into the opposite scenario with yields rising and prices falling, we're still going to see the same. It's going to be the income that drives returns. So let me try and, and bring, bring us back to these two points here of you know, bond yields being higher today than they were. And I understand that it is painful to see our bond and bond fund prices decline. We haven't really had to deal with that for the past three or four decades. But this doesn't mean that bonds and bond funds are broken. So again, we combine these two, com these two concepts. We're earning higher income, and that's leading us to reinvest into the fund and buy more shares of the fund. Combine that with the fact that bonds mature at par. And if you put those two together, then bond funds are self-healing. So for me, that means that with time, bond and hence bond prices naturally recover. We're earning more income along the way while we're waiting for those prices to recover. And that accrues to higher total returns over time to make up for that initial pain that we're feeling today. Dan, help, help me round out this, this bond talk before we move on. Yeah, OK. Um, I, I know we've spent a lot of time on bonds here, and, and again, I, I want to plug this upcoming webinar that our bond guy, Chris Keith, is going to do. Bonds are still key building blocks to any diversified portfolio. They always have been. They always will be. 
again, one bad quarter doesn't change that. So our bottom line is you don't want to be selling bonds at lows or near lows. But I think we need to move on to another topic uh, that goes hand in hand with the recent drop in bond prices and, and the rise in yields, and that's inflation. I think the, the title on this slide says it all. You know, inflation is going to be the wild card in the coming year. Already, the debate has shifted from whether March's 8.5% headline inflation reading for the CPI represents peak inflation, given that some prices have either stopped rising or have fallen a bit, or if we're going to see further big jumps in the consumer price index. But as the chart shows, the CPI hit 8.5% at its last reading, which is the highest since early 1982, four decades ago. Again, many, if not most investors, and I'm guessing most of the people on this call, haven't been around long enough to remember 1982, which was the tail end of the Fed's policy of jacking up rates to halt inflation and inducing a recession as a result. That policy worked to bring inflation down to 2% or so, and it happened pretty quickly in the early 80s. And it, it also worked well in the late 1970s. The one thing I think we can all agree on now that it's April is that our old beliefs that higher inflation would be transitory, well, they've become transitory. But there is some more to that story. What I've got here is a comparison of two inflations, the inflation in flexible goods and services and inflation in sticky goods and services. Flexible inflation is currently running at 20%. Sticky inflation is running about 4.5%, 4.7%. What's flexible and what's sticky? They're terms defined by the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank. Sticky prices are those that change slowly, obviously. The price of a good or service is set, it doesn't move around very quickly. Flexible prices are those that can move quickly. For instance, gas prices, they're very flexible. They change rapidly as oil prices, demand, refining capacity, all of that changes. Um, the, the Atlanta Fed says that a coin-operated laundry, on the other hand, has very sticky prices. I don't know who's going to the coin op these days, but prices at coin-operated laundries change every six and a half years. Um, one study the Fed researchers cite looked at raw data for the 350 spending categories that are considered when the CPI is produced, and they found that half change their prices every 4.3 months. Fuel, fresh fruits, vegetables, pipe gas, used in new cars, lodging, cereals, baked goods, they change their prices pretty frequently. Others, like that laundry, household furnishing costs, medical services, rents are much stickier. So what the Atlanta Fed researchers found is that sticky inflation is a much better prognosticator when it comes to future inflation than flexible price inflation. And that makes sense. If something moves around quickly, it may not be a good indicator of where you're headed long term. And, you know, you can see in the chart, sticky inflation isn't soaring at the same rate as flexible inflation. And it suggests that while inflation will be higher in the months to come, the flexible inflation rate, which seems to be driving the headline rate of inflation, shouldn't be looked at as a good predictor of what's ahead. So why do we at Advisor Investments care so much about the intricacies of inflation rather than just accepting the headline number for what it is? Well, in one sense, we're trying to cut through the noise of a million pundits and soothsayers to figure out just how critical the current inflation numbers are, because in fact, if inflation is soaring out of control and the Fed overdoes its tightening of the monetary screws, the worry is we'll have a recession. And a recession is really what worries Wall Street beyond the bond market. So at Advisor Investments, we keep a little dashboard, a recession dashboard, uh, and we actively monitor where we think we're headed and what the likelihood of recession is. And many data points go into the dashboard, but here are a few. Many have been led to believe, particularly over the past month or so, that the single best predictor of a recession is embedded in the $46 trillion bond market. In some senses, it's the wisdom of the crowds that people believe in that drives this predictor, and it's called the inverted yield curve. I think Liz mentioned it at the beginning, and I thought, oh my gosh, I hope we don't drive everybody away when they hear inverted yield curve. Before I lose some of you, because it sounds complicated, hang on, it's not. And what I'm going to show you will make you the most listened to guest at the next cocktail party you go to. So hang in.
Okay. Bond investors often talk about the yield curve. This is a very simple concept. It's the shape of a line that graphs the yield of, of a, a bond and what it's paying against its maturity. Typically, the yield curve line moves up and to the right as you measure bonds of longer and longer maturities, which makes sense. If you're going to lend money to someone or some company or some government entity, you want to be paid more interest the longer your money is going to be tied up. That's why a 10-year bond typically pays a higher yield or more interest than a five-year bond, and the five-year bond pays more than a two-year bond, et cetera. And that's what the yield curve looked like at the beginning of 2022. Now, this is what it looked like on March 31 as the quarter came to a close. You see the yield on that five-year Treasury bond maturing in 2027? It's 12 basis points or 0.12% higher than the yield on the 10-year Treasury bond. And it's one basis point or 0.01% higher than the yield on the 30-year Treasury. This is what's referred to as an inverted yield curve. But the relationship that bond market veterans and strategists look to for confirmation, and I put that in quotes, confirmation of a pending recession, is the 10-year bond against both the two-year and the three-month bonds. So at the end of the quarter, yes, the 10-year and the two-year had virtually the same yield. And I say virtually because, in fact, the yield on the two-year bond was 0.004% higher. Um, and the, this inversion of the two-year versus the 10-year lasted for all of three days. It reverted back to normal on April 5th, and the spread is actually now a positive 40 or so basis points. In other words, the inversion was an anomaly. Now, whether you believe that an inversion signals a coming recession or not, here are a few things to keep in mind. One, yes, the chart shows both the two-year to 10-year spread, that, that relationship, or the three-month to 10-year spread have both inverted before each of the last six recessions. But let me remind you that over the almost 50 years in this chart, we've only had six recessions. So a data scientist would laugh at the tiny sample size here. Also, as you can see, these inversions have occurred well before recessions, sometimes a lot before. And finally, look at the right-hand side of the chart. This is where we are today. While that two-year, 10-year line has touched the inversion region, as I mentioned, the other line representing the three-month to 10-year spread, which a lot of strategists say is just as important, has been moving in the other direction. And that's not something seen in prior periods and suggests that all the hue and cry over inversions and recessions may be a little premature. But let me give you a final slide on this topic. Even if we assume that the three-day inversion between the two-year and 10-year bond did in fact signal a recession is coming, that it was Paul Revere's lamps and you know the recession is on the way, when would it start? Across the last six recessions, the inverted yield curve was anywhere from nine months to 17 months ahead of the fact. On average, stocks gained 6% between the, the inversion and the start of the recession. And the S&P also generated an average 6% return in the 12 months after the inversion. So stocks typically fall during recessions, but timing the recession, trying to get out of stocks before it hits and not missing out on the gains that might precede it is really a fool's errand. So with that, I've talked a lot about recessions and, and inversions and inflation. Jeff, tell me a little bit more about what we've got going on here. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And, and we'll talk a bit about that kind of time, time recessions and what the market looks like in it. So Dan mentioned that dashboard that we maintain and, and look at for what might, if there's a recession coming. And here I've really just translated it into a probability of recession. It reflects the percent of the signals on our dashboard that are flashing a warning or not. And looking at past recessions, and again, I'd reiterate Dan's point that there's a limited number of observations here, so we need to take it with a grain of salt. But looking at past recessions, our dashboard did a pretty decent job of flagging the risk of an oncoming recession. Certainly not perfect. It was late to flag the recession in 1973 if we'd been uh, doing this back then. Uh, but at this moment, our recession dashboard is all quiet. Although, as Dan pointed out, I think inflation running at the highest level it has in 40 years is a bit of a wild card. 
And maybe that's why we're seeing recession fears on the rise, at least according to the number of Google searches involving recession, they, they've started rising. So given that concern, plus we know that the recession dashboard that we look at isn't foolproof, let's just say a recession is coming and we can ask, how has the stock market performed in past recessions? So here's a look at the S&P 500 during past recessions, and it measures the performance of the broad index from the start of the recession until the recession is declared over. And there's a few things that stand out to me. The big one is that no two recessions are alike. Some are very short, lasting just two months. Others are very long, lasting over a year. In some recessions, stocks fall dramatically. In others, the declines aren't so bad. Now, recessions clearly aren't good for stocks, but the only similarity that I see in these recessions is that stocks reach a bottom before the end of each recession. Now, given how different all those lines were, I have to be a little hesitant to do this, but I'm going to try and see what the average market looks like during a recession. So how did stocks do on average from the beginning of a recession to the end of it? And given those different lengths from two months to over a year, I tried to standardize it by putting them on the same time, time scale that gives us the percent complete yardstick. So in this chart, 0% is the beginning of each recession, 50% would be the midpoint of a recession, and 100% is the end, the recession is declared over. And those gray areas defines the upper and lower bounds of the stock market performance at each step along the way. So let me give you an example. We take the midway point, 50% of past recessions, the S&P's return has ranged from down 19 points, down 19%, which was in 1970, to up 4%, which was in 2001. And on average, stocks were down 11% at the midway point of each recession. Now, while economic downturns clearly aren't good for the stock market, I bet that that 11% average decline halfway through a recession is not as bad as most people would have guessed or expected. Now, as I shared, one characteristic of these of the market, of the stock market that was common across all the recessions, is that they bottom and begin rallying before the end of each recession was over. So on average, stocks hit that bottom, that low point, 60% of the way through the recession. Now, of course, knowing when you're 60% over in real time is definitely a challenge. This stat argues for the need or the desire to maintain stock exposure during recessions. If you wait for the all clear, you've likely already missed out on that initial market rebound. So as I said, Dan and I have covered a lot of ground today. So to recap and highlight the points we're trying to make here is First off, while it's counterintuitive, buying stocks in times of conflict has actually paid off through and over time. Second, bonds, despite having their worst quarter in decades, are not broken. They're self-healing, they're offering more income, and they mature at par. And then finally, while our recession dashboard is pretty quiet, uh, we know that inflation is a wild card out there. It's running at the hottest pace in a generation. And that recessions do happen. I mean, I love seeing headlines or quotes in the media saying a recession is inevitable. Isn't that always the case? But the point here is that recessions, while not good for stock markets, they do present investment opportunities. Now, one final comment before we get to your questions. And I know we've spoken at length about why we have confidence in bonds and bond funds. But recognize that this doesn't mean that we're not constantly searching for investment opportunities that can complement our current lineup. We're always searching for ways to make our portfolios more robust and more resilient, whether that's on the bond or the stock side of the portfolio. And we recently had a fund that fit this role nicely, River Canyon Total Return. It was a niche bond fund. It was holding securitized bonds. It was simply different than the more traditional Vanguard and Fidelity bond funds that we invest in. It seemed to zig when the others were zagging. And we recently sold the fund because the manager left, he departed from the fund, and we simply weren't comfortable with his replacement. But if we find something that could refill that complementary role, we'll jump on it. And not because we don't have confidence in bonds, but because it makes your and our portfolios more resilient, better able to perform in different market environments. And look, I constantly get bombarded with investment pitches, and they often fit in that category of alternatives. 
be it opportunity zones, private credit, direct lending, and on and on, you should see my inbox. I've gotten really good at saying no, because most of these are expensive, they're illiquid, unpredictable, unreliable. The return prospects, frankly, I think are dubious. But that doesn't stop us from looking. We just have a higher bar that investments need to clear if they're going to be, quote unquote, different from those standard stock bond stock positions that we know are the building blocks of a diversified portfolio. So with that, let me say thank you again for your time today, and let me hand it back to Liz so we can get to your questions. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, that was an excellent primer on bonds and a great tease for next week's um, dedicated webinar with Chris Keith on bonds. And um, you'll see the invitation to sign up on your screen, and you also most of you will receive information in the days ahead over email as well. Um, also really helpful, Jeff, on that conversation about recessions and uh, just an excellent point back to one of our core philosophies, which is time in the market, not market timing. Um, okay, well, we're going to transition over. We've got a ton of questions here lined up, so I'll just in, uh, quickly introduce our second poll about financial planning. Um, we'd actually like to know how you prefer to receive your financial planning advice and insights. And you can check all that apply, uh, whether live conversations with your advisor or financial planner, guides, reports, and articles, podcasts with practical tips, uh, retirement planning webinars, short educational video clips, or case studies with real life folks and their experiences. Please take a moment to share your preference. So next we're gonna hear from Jim Lowell, Advisor Investments Chief investment officer, also editor of the Fidelity Investor Newsletter and many numerous books on investing. You'll see Jim almost daily in the media. Um, you can catch all of his appearances as well as those of my other colleagues on advisorinvestments.com. Jim's joined by Charlie Toole. Charlie's a member of the firm's senior investment committee. He's also an engineer by training. He's done has had more than a decade of investment experience He's a CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst, and a Certified Financial Planner, CFP, and a Portfolio Manager on our Dividend Income Strategy. And Liz Laprade is a Research Analyst. She assists with conducting quantitative and qualitative analysis of the mutual funds and portfolio managers that we invest in here. She does due diligence on funds and does a lot of, as Jeff alluded to, a lot of kicking of tires and research on investments that we may consider in the future. So let's see what you all had to say about financial planning. Well, we don't actually have past information to compare to, but I, in my role here working with clients, I can say it's, it's wonderful to see that many of you value live conversations with financial planner, it's a really important part of our, our offer here at Advisor Investments. So that's great to see. Okay, Jim, I'm gonna hand this over to you for the q and I know we've got a lot of questions and we'll kick it off here with our first question for Charlie. Excellent, thanks Liz. And Jeff, Dan, I've been busy taking notes from your presentation. It was an excellent presentation in summation of the benefits of investing in bonds when virtually every other headline is telling people to do exactly the opposite. So I thought that was thoroughly well done. Uh, Charlie, as Liz intimated, we see Grayson from Santa Fe, New Mexico asking if there are good strategies to defend against rising inflation, um, that wild card that Jeff and Dan were just talking about. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And uh, thank you, Grayson, for the question. Um, I think really one of the best strategies to guard against rising inflation is, is one that Jeff touched upon at the beginning when he talked about the alternative investment areas, and that's commodities. Uh, as Jeff mentioned in his slide, uh, commodities are up nearly 25% so far this year, certainly providing protection against inflation. But before you jump right into the commodities pool, I wanna provide two points of caution about investing in commodities. First, they're very volatile. Uh, just taking oil, for example, the most popular commodity, uh, oil has nearly three times the volatility on a daily basis that the stock market does. And why is that important? Well, that means bigger, price movements on the way up and on the way down. And historically, commodities, after big price run-ups, usually have big drops. You know, just sticking with oil, for example, you go back to 2007, 2008, the price of, uh, uh, the price of oil per barrel went from $50 to $150 
all the way down to $35 at the depths of the financial crisis. Flash forward a few years later to 2011, oil had recovered to $115, only to drop by 35% from May to October. And even recently, 2017 to 2018, oil prices nearly doubled, only to give it all back in three months. And even in this most recent run-up in 2021 and 2022, we've seen oil rise from $50 at the beginning of 2021 to $130 earlier this year. But along the way, there were drops of 17, 19, and 25 percent. And today, oil sits 21 percent below its all-time or below the high earlier from this year. And don't think I'm cherry picking with just using oil. If you look at lumber prices over the last two years, that's even a wilder ride. So please be cautious and please be aware that commodities are very volatile, much more volatile than stocks or bonds. The second point when dealing or investing with commodities is getting access directly to the commodity. It's very difficult to do that. Uh, you can certainly, because, and the reason why it's difficult is if you buy a contract on the New York Mercantile Exchange or, or the Chicago Exchange, you're buying a contract that you have to take delivery of the oil when that contract matures. And I don't think many of us can store barrel barrels of oil or bushels of, of wheat once we take delivery of them. So you have to use other investment vehicles there are funds and ETFs, exchange-traded funds that invest in commodities, but it doesn't give you the same investment experience. I won't get into the details of the plumbing of these investment vehicles, but just know that the way that they're designed, you don't get the exact return that you do in by investing directly in the commodity. Sometimes you get better returns, sometimes you get worse returns, but it's just not the same. So please be aware of some of these issues when investing with commodities. One of the things that you can do is invest in commodity-linked stocks. So instead of investing in oil, you can invest in the stocks of companies that drill and extract oil from the ground, energy companies. These companies have done very well year-to-date, up nearly 45%. So there are other ways to take advantage or to protect against rising inflation. If you get into the fixed income realm, there are a couple of areas in the fixed income market you can invest in as well, uh, the first being what are called Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, or TIPS. Uh, these are treasuries issued by the U.S. government where the principal and the interest payments are adjusted by inflation. So you do get some inflation protection there. But like Jeff and, and Dan were talking about with bonds, they are sensitive to movements in interest rates. And because rates have been rising, those bonds have fallen this year, though not as much as traditional bonds. They're down about 5%. And finally, one other way you can protect against inflation is to invest in floating rate bonds. They're not necessarily linked to inflation, but they are protected against rising rates. And I think a lot of investors associate rising rates with inflation. And so the way that these bonds work is that the interest rate that they paid, the interest rate that they pay is linked to a short term benchmark like the Fed funds rate. And so when the Fed raises that Fed funds rate, the interest payment on these floating rate bonds adjusts higher. So that's a protection against rising rates, which is typically what's seen during inflation. And again, there's a double-edged sword because if rates drop, the Fed funds rate drops, the interest rate payment on these bonds will drop. So those are some ways you can protect against inflation. Uh, Liz, we have a question for you or a couple of questions from, for you. We've got Raj in Barrington, Illinois, and Alan from Amherst, Massachusetts. And they're both thinking about how to invest in uncertain times. So beyond stocks and bonds, what investment options can you suggest? And other than cash, what are some defensive plays? Thanks, Raj, for the question. So I will start by saying, yes, there are options beyond stocks and bonds. And if your definition of defensive is a store of value, then truly no, there isn't anything better than cash. It's the only thing you can be you know, 100% sure you put a dollar in, you're going to get that dollar back out. Those are my short answers. The longer answer to both is that there are parts of the market outside bonds, stocks, and cash that can behave differently. So I'm talking about alternatives, which Jeff and Charlie have already spent time on. So commodities, real estate, or, or liquid alternatives. And I'm going to kind of link together what both Jeff and Charlie have already said. But you know, those investments at times could act as defense, but only in the sense that they could be up when stocks and bonds are down. 
but they are not defensive in the sense that they are good stores of value. And that's because, like Charlie said, most of those options, while potentially offering diversification in down markets, can also exaggerate the downside more than stocks and a lot more than bonds. So, for example, yes, commodities are up year to date while bonds and stocks are down. However, if you take, say, March 2020's sell-off as an example, stocks were down about 30%, the iShares Commodity ETF down 35%, and the Ag Bond Index only down 7%. So yes, while stocks and bonds both being down last quarter was definitely frustrating, although rare, I still think of bonds after cash as the best defense for a portfolio. Liz, can I just jump in right there um, and talk about an antonym of defense, uh, namely Bitcoin? Uh, wasn't Bitcoin supposed to be a good alternative to the stocks, bonds, and cash? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Bitcoin is not, in my mind, a safe store of value. Therefore, it is not an appropriate swap for cash. Uh, the volatility of Bitcoin is so high that if you're going to own it in a portfolio, I would maybe almost group it into that alternative space uh, where it might behave differently than stocks, bonds, and cash. But if you're going to hold Bitcoin, I always suggest that you be comfortable with it losing, say, up to 50% of its value at times, because that has happened. Um, I, I don't think specifically Bitcoin was ever meant to be a swap for cash. I think it's possible that a digital dollar exists in the future. Uh, we know the government is taking it a bit more seriously, crypto, I mean, a bit more seriously with um, President Biden's recent executive order, which is requiring various organizations to do real in-depth research on offering a digital dollar. You know, how that works and what it looks like, I don't know. Um, but I don't think Bitcoin by itself will replace the U.S. dollar or should replace someone's, you know, defensive store of value part of their portfolio. And I see another question for you, back to you, Jim. Uh, Masayo from Tempe, Arizona, notes the geopolitical events in Ukraine affecting investment markets and asks if it's different this time from past conflicts. Well, Masaya, I wish we knew the answer. Um, the uh, inevitable uh, truth will be that time will have to tell us. One of the things that we have really not seen in my investment career is what could easily turn into a global war uh, on economic terms rather than bodily terms. When you have a wild card like Russia, their relationship with China, and of course, Russia's stranglehold in terms of European sources for energy and staples, food, agriculture. Um, it is something that's, that's clearly troubling, clearly did trouble the markets. But as Jeff pointed out right at the outset, it troubled the markets a lot less than one would have expected. While the, while the first quarter was tough across all boards, um, it was not nearly as tough as it could have been, given that the ravages of, of Russia's war of, you know, war of choice was beginning to unfold and grow in terms of scope and scale. It's still way too early to know what Russia's intentions are, and hence it's too early to know if this is going to be different this time. And there's no need for us to have to try and predict whether or not it will be. Instead, as Dan so carefully pointed out, uh, we'll stay focused on the discipline that has serve, served us well for decades uh, in terms of both focus on diversification, but also focus on, on risk awareness and, and appropriate risk mitigation. Uh, I do think that when we are focused on the potential toll, we'll zero in, as we always do, on the U.S. consumer, the driver of our economy to a certain extent, the driver of the global economy. And so far, with the U.S. consumer being fully employed and imminently employable, for every, uh, for every job seeker, there's one and a half, two jobs available. You know, this is not uh, the time when we would expect the U.S. consumer to crack. In fact, with uh, masks being lifted, summer travel just about to start, we wouldn't be surprised if we saw a surge in consumer spending on travel and leisure. So it may be different this time. We'll certainly do our best in terms of focusing on the fundamentals earnings, interest rates, economic data to help us frame our response. We certainly won't be driven by other people's fears that always make the headlines and tell us what we ought to do. We'll stay focused on the facts and move in accordance with them. Uh, with that, Liz, can you bring up the final poll question, please? So 
One of the things that we are able to do now is you can provide multiple responses to this question as well. Which investment themes are you interested in hearing about? And you can check all that apply. And one of the things that we're able to do is to then take this information and incorporate it into the next webinar and also to all of the things that we write about and present to you on a weekly and biweekly and quarterly basis. Um, Advisor Investments is nothing if not very focused uh, on making sure that our clients are among the best informed investors uh, on not just Wall Street, but Main Street. Dan's point about uh, being well-versed in bonds, making you the most popular person at your next barbecue or cocktail party uh, was tongue in cheek, but but absolutely true. We want you to ask us questions about your portfolio. We want to be able to know how you are feeling about the current state of your own financial life, as well as always stay focused on your long-term investment goals. So, Liz, let's, are the results in yet? Or do we have many? Oh, no, they are. So, which investment themes are you interested in hearing about? Stock market performance. We've heard a lot about that today. Bonds and investing for income, running neck and neck. Fidelity and Vanguard news. Um, good to see some loyalists in the mix. Tactical investment strategies, clearly uh, on everyone's mind. Uh, and alternative investments, cryptocurrency, maybe flagging a little bit here. Um, it's great to see the tactical investment strategies interest. Uh, we will try and incorporate that on, on a going forward basis because I know that we have some tactical investing strategists who are expert in their field. Uh, with that, let's go to the next question. And I know we're getting tight for time, but Liz, this is this is a mission critical question. And it relates to everything we've been talking about. Uh, Lindell from San Diego asking about international investment options and about the challenges the sector is having this year and whether or not it still makes sense to invest internationally. Yes, that is an important question. So most international funds are down more than the U.S. this year. Um, broader international markets were actually outperforming the U.S. for a while at the start of the year, you know, especially emerging markets. Um, but the outlier event of the Ukraine invasion hit international a lot harder than it's hit the U.S. Um, Europe specifically, so countries like France, Germany, and Italy have sold off quite a bit. You know, they're down, most of them are down double digits this year. And that's because of how reliant they are on for on Russia for oil and natural gas. So basically, if your international fund didn't own a lot of energy, then it probably is struggling this year, at least compared to U.S. markets. Um, but I would say with an abrupt sell off like those we've seen, there has to be plenty of stocks that sold off with disregard for the fact that they're actually great companies. There have been many examples of companies reporting strong earnings and great revenue guidance, but have sold off nonetheless with the war news. Um, you know, I think it's an environment ripe for buying some of those companies that have sold off that are good companies at discounts for the right stock picker, so the right fund manager. And if we have time for one more, Liz, let me let me just yeah. jump in <laughs> wasn't and sure. say we don't have time for one more, unfortunately. But of course, uh, we will answer all of your questions hopefully within the next forty-eight hours. So you will not have to go long before you hear us respond to what has been an absolute flood of very interesting and insightful questions. Um, and I think what I will do at this juncture is take the moment to reiterate what Jan and De Dan and Jeff and also what Liz has mentioned, and that's our bond specialist, Chris Keith, 30 plus years in the fixed income business, an absolute expert in the field, will next Wednesday, same time, same webinar channel, uh, talk about bonds. The title is The Pain, Promise, and Future of Fixed Income. And given everyone's heightened interest in learning as much as they can about bonds, this is an absolute must go to webinar. I'll be there myself, as will my colleagues. And on behalf of my colleagues, Liz, let me turn it back to you to end this webinar. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, you will receive a survey evaluation of this presentation uh, tomorrow, and we really value feedback. So please let us know what you thought and what we could be doing to make these even better in the future.
um, you'll also receive a replay of the webinar by the end of the week. With any additional questions, um, especially if you had questions today that we didn't get to because we ran out of time, please contact us here at Advisor and we'll do our best to get you answers for all of your questions. We are the advisor that you can talk to, so please don't hesitate. Thank you very much and goodbye.